So for the next part of my talk, I'm going to, to discuss uh, reliability. In, in particular, we would like to ensure that our reduced order model always works, regardless of how good our training data were. And this is a very hard problem, as you can imagine, but, it's to, but, but if successful, it will open up the possibility of reduced order models to work on a, on a much wider class of problems where typical uh, subspace low dimensional subspace assumptions fail. So this is, uh, so this is what we're going to call um, a posteriori H refinement for reduced order models. So I just showed you some results with the NAT reduced order model. I argued they were very good. We're getting less than 1% error, 230 times CPU hour savings. Um, and this is a nice result for this problem. However, as we know, ROMs are not guaranteed to be accurate in all cases, right? And in particular, this should, this should be obvious because ROM accuracy is limited by the information in fee, right? I've assumed that my state lives in, this, in the low dimensional subspace spanned by the columns of fee. So if that assumption fails or breaks down in some way, our reduced order model will not be, will not be accurate. So I've just showed you a problem that is quite complex where reduced order models work. I'll now show you a much simpler problem on which reduced order models fail. So let's consider the Invisiburgers burgers equation in one dimension. So it's a one-dimensional problem, and all this equation describes is a shock propagating from left to right through a domain. So what I'm going to show you is basically we're going to start with some initial condition, and the shock wave is going to move from left to right through this one-dimensional domain. And what I'm going to try to simulate is, is this uh, Invisiburgers burgers equation for 50 seconds, which is enough to get the shock to move all the way out of the domain. And I'm going to, but I'm going to sim, uh, train my ROM by collecting snapshots only for the first two and a half seconds of the shock moving. So we're going to have a domain. Um, I'm going to train the ROM for the shock moving, let's say, a little bit through the domain, and then try to predict with the ROM for the entire time interval, right? Furthermore, I, my ROM won't be reduced all that much. We're going to go from 250 to 150, so we've barely reduced the dimensionality. Yet I'll show you that the reduced order model fails miserably. So what we're showing here is the conserve variable as a function of space for different time instances. So the shock is moving from left to right as I promised. You can see the full order model, which is in black, is just describes a simple shock propagation with some growth. Um, and the reduced order model works really well for the first two and a half seconds. But then because it knows nothing about shock positions past two and a half seconds, because I've stopped the training at that point, the ROM completely blows up and doesn't generate anything useful beyond two and a half seconds, right? So another way to think about this is that the ROM is inaccurate when it's outside the predictive domain of phi, right? We violated our subspace assumption, so there's no way that the ROM can work. So what are ways that we can get around this? So folks have looked at uh, adaptation methods. And if you look in the literature, you do a literature search and you look for ROM adaptation, um, you can classify most of the approaches that have been developed as a priori adaptation methods, which is not really what we're looking for. These methods essentially develop a unique reduced order model for separate regions of the input space, time domain, or state space, meaning that they somehow divide the input space up, build a reduced order model that's specially tailored for different parts of that input space, and then as the ROM is used in different parts, they can adapt the ROM to that part of the, of, of, of the space, which is a very nice idea, but it provides no mechanism to improve the ROM a posteriori. So this is really an a priori adaptation set of methods. So it's not relevant to what we wanna, want to do, although they can be useful in many cases. If you look to, to, to what people have done for a posteriori adaptation, there's really been only one method, and that is sort of the simplest thing that you might imagine, which is taking our reduced order model, tracking if it's working well by evaluating, let's say, the residual, and if it fails, we're going to revert to the full model for that time step, solve the full model, which is very expensive, and then add that solution to our reduced basis. Right? That will enrich the basis in some way, which is nice. You have a way of improving the ROM, but it's obviously very expensive. It's going to incur, essentially, a full order model simulation. And furthermore, if you imagine applying that to our shock moving, what this approach would produce is basically every time that we get past outside of our training regime, we'd solve the full model, add that to our basis. The shock would move. I would have to, I would, my ROM would again fail. I'd have to again solve the full model and so on. So basically what would happen is past two and a half seconds, I would only be solving the full order model, right? Which is not very attractive, especially when we consider fluid dynamics problems where we have a lot of discontinuities moving. We have a lot of convected, advection dominated flows. And, uh, and so on. So what our goal is, is to devise some cheap mechanism to, ref to improve or refine the reduced order model a posteriori. And here's the main idea of this approach. So, we liked, so what, what we developed was a, a ROM analog to mesh adaptive H refinement. So if you're familiar with P1 finite elements, you know that H, H adaptation as applied to finite elements works as follows. We start with, let's say, P1 finite elements in one dimension. 
we have a, a, given, uh, a given basis vector. We can then split the support of that vector into multiple vectors with the same polynomial degree. But we're going to split the support over multiple elements, right? So this is a way that you can think about finite element H refinement. So what would an analog be in discrete space if we are dealing with vectors and not, uh, not necessarily functions that are distributed over space? Because we're thinking about finite volume methods where you may not have this type of time continuous description. So what you can do is take a given basis vector, right? And we can actually split the support of that up into multiple vectors where the, the white entries here simply imply zeros, right? So the idea is we're going to take a vector, split it up into multiple vectors, and in doing so, we can generate a few nice properties, even though it seems like an obvious thing to do, right? Number one, we generate hierarchical subspaces. The range of a given vector is obviously a subspace of the range of that split up vector, because we can always recover this vector if the coefficients that are multi that post multiply this matrix are all identical, right? So we're generating a hierarchy of subspaces similar to a finite element H refinement. And furthermore, we know in the limit of full splitting, we recover the full order model, right? This is assuming that all the entries of here of this vector are non-zero. So if we, this is kind of obvious to see in pictures that if we split this thing out all the way, the range of a diagonal matrix with all non-zero entries is Rn, which is by definition the full order model, right? Solving the full order, mo order model over a basis of full dimension is the same as solving the full order model. So this is a really nice way of doing this. We don't have to ever go back to the full order model, and we can always refine our reduced order model and eventually approach the full model but in doing so. But the question is, how do we do so efficiently and hope to uh, generate a fast convergence rate? So here's how we do this. We, we essentially adopt all of the ingredients that have been applied for goal-oriented refinement in finite, finite elements, finite volumes, and so on. So I'll first present the adaptive algorithm we're going to use. I'll then explain specifically how we refine these basis vectors, because there are combinatorially many ways to split up a given basis vector. And I'll then explain how we choose which vectors to split. And we're going to use dual weighted residuals um, as error indicators uh, for, for, that, for that purpose. So what's the adaptive algorithm? How does this actually integrate into our time-dependent simulation of the reduced order model? So let's assume we're at a given time step n. We have some basis, phi. Uh, what we're going to do is first solve the reduced order model. Let's say it's a Galerkin model. This could also be psi if it's LSPG. So we solve the reduced order model for the current, current ROM solution. We then have some error indicator. I'll explain later what that is, but let's think of it as just a residual norm. If our estimate of the output error is too large, we then refine the basis and keep solving the ROM until we satisfy that tolerance. Right? So we're going to basically keep refining our basis until we're accurate enough for what we demand. And then every so often, we're going to reset our basis so it doesn't keep growing in time. Right. This is just to keep things low dimensional. What does the refined step look like? We're going to start with an initial basis and a, and a current solution, and we're going to output a refined basis. And we're going to, we're going to follow the solve, estimate, mark, refine um, method of that, that's commonly pursued. So we first compute a prolongation operator, which I'll explain, in a fine basis. So we have our current basis. We have a, a, then a fine basis that, that, is, that corresponds to the, that current basis being split. We then solve for error indicators. So we're going to compute a coarse adjoint solution. We then estimate by using those coarse adjoint solutions to, to compute error indicators tied to the fine basis. We'll then use those error indicators to mark the, the vectors that we want to split. So if a vector generates many children split vectors that have large error indicators, we're going to choose that one to split. And then for all the ones we've identified, we refine them by splitting, by splitting those vectors up. And we may have to apply QR factorization with column pivoting to remove possible rank deficiency from our basis. Um, and that's sort of essentially, in a nutshell, how the refinement works. So now I'll discuss, namely, ingre for ingredient two, which is how we compute the prolongation operator and the fine basis. And then after that, I'll follow with how we uh, solve and estimate by doing this, this dual weighted residual approach. So how do we refine? So we, we reason about refinement as follows. We, we essentially construct a tree data structure that encodes the way in which we're going to split a given basis vector. So the way that you can interpret this is a basis in a current, at a current node. So, so a current node is, is characterized by an index, let's say just d equals 1, and uh, a child function which describes the topology of this tree. So if a, if a, if a vector in, in state 1 is split, it's going to then become a, two vectors in states 2 and 3. Right? That just describes the topology of the tree. The, this element function then describes the non, it, 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 it describes what elements of a vector in that state are non-zero, right? So, if I have, if I, in this example, I have um, a, a six-dimensional problem. So, if I, every vector starts off in state one, meaning that it's dense, so all entries one to six are non-zero, right? 
if I, if I imbue this with the following requirements, I can then recover nice properties. So I'm going to enforce that my root node includes all elements, meaning that I'm, that if I, if it, that I'm going to allow all vectors to be dense to start with. Each element has a single leaf node, so 1 to n, mean, in this case 1 to 6, all is characterized by a single leaf node, right? So each of these elements has one leaf node. So what that means is that when we split, if we completely split something up, we can recover the full order model. Disjoint support of children, so we're going to make sure that, that we're splitting into vectors of disjoint support, and obviously the union of the children, of the elements of the children equals the elements of the parents. It turns out, and we proved this in our paper, that conditions 1 to 2 ensure that we converge the full model, and in, in condition 4 guarantees higher, hierarchical refined spaces. So here's an example just to get, build some intuition. Let's say we start with a vector in state 1, right? It's just going to be a, a dense vector with these entries. If I then go through a sequence of splits, so I split it once, right? I then identify this vector, I split that one, and then I split this vector, I end up with, with a basis of dimension 4 with these entries, right? So if I was in state, the vector in state 2 has non-zero elements 1, 3, and 4, 1, 3, 4. Uh, in state 7, we have an, a non-zero entry of, of 2, and so on. So what we can see is we've just split up this basis vector to generate a basis uh, that's of higher fidelity than the original basis. That's the main idea. Now the question is, how do we actually construct this tree? So we're going to use the following heuristic to build the tree. The heuristic is as follows. State variables that are strongly correlated or anti-correlated should reside in the same tree node. And this is why that's a good, a, a good idea. So let's imagine we have one state variable, and it tends to do this in time, right? So it tends to evolve in time. So if I'm going to say this is t, and I'll say this is x1, state variable 1, x2. These are obviously correlated vectors in time. And so if I have a basis vector that, that so if my basis has a value, let's say, let's say that this here is 1 and this is 2. If my basis has uh, an entry that is twice the value for the first one as the second one, then these vectors can be exactly described with one basis vector, assuming that their respective entries are the same. Right? Similarly, if I have an anti-correlated variable that goes exactly opposite in time, these all three can be described by one basis vector, assuming that the entries of that basis are appropriately uh, chosen, right? So we have, the same, let's say, negative values. So, so for x3, we have the opposite value as is assigned x1, and x2 is half the value of, of x1, right? So if these are, the point is if we're correlated or anti-correlated in time, we can represent them with a single basis vector. So they should reside on the same tree node because they're going to essentially, as we split vectors, these, these, uh, these, these state vector entries will tend to stay, on, stay together as, and be represented by a given fixed basis vector. So here's how we actually enact this in practice. So we take our state variable observation history. So let's say we return to our snapshot matrix, right? We return to our snapshot matrix like this. And then what I do is I plot each row of this, because this describes the time evolution of the, first gener of the first state variable. This describes the time evolution of the second state variable, and so on, right? So each row of our snapshot matrix can be plotted in, let's say this is the number of time steps n, right? So this is 1 to n. I can plot each of these time evolutions in Rn. Uh, I normalize that, that variable. And if the first observation is negative, I flip it over the origin to account for anti-correlation. Then I can recursively apply k-means clustering. So in this example, I have two time steps. So I'm plotting things in R2, right? And I have six state variables, right? So I'm assuming I'm in, I'm in uh, my full order model has six degrees of freedom. So I, I, for variable one, I have its observation, its value at time step one, and then at time step two, and so on. And this, uh, this, this is a synthetic example where I've artificially said that, that, these, uh, that the blue variables are correlated or anti-correlated in time, same with the green and the red. So after I apply steps one and two, I, I, have, con I have sort of uh, processed the, this data such that, such that it looks like this. And what, what you can see here is that the data that are correlated or anti-correlated in time tend to show up in the same space in, in Euclidean space, right? So they, they, that processing allows you to spatially kind of co-locate 
uh, correlated and anti-correlated variables. So what we can then do is recursively apply k-means clustering. So we're going to, let's say in this example, I set k equals 3. Hopefully the first cluster would be found here, here, and here. That's going to populate the first layer of my tree, right? So I, I'm going from the first layer. This will then go down to layers 1, 2, 3. As I zoom in here, I can then apply k-means clustering. That would yield another level of the tree, let's say. And if I apply k-means clustering within this cluster, that would yield another cluster and so on. So I can recursively build up uh, this tree by, by, by this mechanism. So now let's talk about the refinement machinery. So what I'm going to, so, so what we have to do here is somehow uh, describe how we're going to split up the basis algebraically. So we start with some coarse basis, which is just let's say one vector. If I then split it up according to the tree I've defined, I can then define a fine basis, which is just the split up basis, and a prolongation operator, which is trivial in this case. It's just a vector of all ones. This is really interesting because in the typical case of refining finite elements, this prolongation operator is not trivial to devise. Usually you need some kind of interpolant of the coarse solution onto, the, onto some embedded fine mesh. In our case, it's very trivial to define. Right? So we have a coarse basis, a fine basis, where the fine basis is of dimension that is associated with, with the number of children in the parent, the prolongation operator, which is all ones actually in this case, um, a pro, the, prolong, the, the prolongated generalized coordinate, so I can hit my coarse my, my core solution with the prolongation operator to get that in the fine coordinates. And then a restriction operator, which is not unique, but we use the more penrose pseudo inverse to define it. So using this notation, we can then define what error how, how we develop these error indicators. So the way we do this is we do a dual solve on the coarse grid, so on our coarse basis, and we then prolongate that to our fine basis. Very similar to how it's done typically in finite elements. You do a dual solve or an adjoint solve, and you prolongate that to an underlying fine mesh. So the idea of dual weighted residual error indicators is we can make it goal oriented. So we reduce the error in some specific output quantity G. And it's going to be completely analogous to duality based methods for a variety of discretization methods. So here's how it works. So we start with some, uh, fine out, some output that we care about G. And we approximate its value at the unknown fine solution to first order about the known coarse solution. Right? So we can compute this and we compute the Jacobian of that. And then what we have on the right-hand side is the increment in the solution from the known coarse solution to the unknown fine solution. Right? So this is my, my increment in my solution. And I've prolongated the coarse one to represent them in the same coordinates. What I then do is approximate the fine residual. So we know that if we're using Galerkin, for example, this fine residual will be 0 by definition. I can approximate again this to first order about the known coarse solution. So here's just the expression, the first order expression about the coarse solution. We get the same solution increment showing up on the right-hand side. I can then solve this for the error, right? So I, I, I just basically uh, solve this by applying the inverse of this Jacobian transpose, and we obtain or of this Jacobian, we obtain the following result for the error, and I can substitute two into one to obtain this result. So I have now an approximation of the error to first order, the error in the output quantity of interest to first order, as basically this dual weighted residual. So it's called a dual weighted residual, right? Here's the dual, here's the residual. Um, and this adjoint solution is going to satisfy this system of equations. So this is just simple linear algebra. Uh, if you want to convince yourself, you can, divide, you can derive this for yourself. The point is, we first solve for the coarse adjoint solution. We know the residual. We substitute it here to get a first order approximation of the error in the quantity I care about. However, this is a little bit expensive, right? We want to avoid fine solves because we're at our current coarse representation with an unsplit basis. So we're going to approximate this fine adjoint solution as a prolongated coarse adjoint solution. So it's very simple. We just simply introduce a, a coarse counterpart of this adjoint solution. So we compute y hat big H. And we then prolongate that to, 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 to the fine coordinates. Right? So we, we, we prolongate it according to this equation. And then we, make the, and then we substitute into this, this guy here. And we obtain a first order approximation of the error now using, cheaply computable, um, using a cheaply computable dual solution. Turns out this right-hand side can be bounded by cheaply computable error indicators delta, 
where, where, where th th this delta is just a, a dual data residual uh, component. So what this is saying is that each potentially fine basis vector uh, is given an error indicator that somehow tells us about how, bad, how poorly we're representing the output quantity of interest. So the way that our dual weighted residual, so the way that we're going to identify basis vectors to split is we'll look at all of its children, sum up all of those error indicators, and the parent that has the children that have the worst error indicators is going to then be split. That's how we actually use this in practice. So what I'll do now is basically show you this exact same example. I showed you that it did not work. And now I'm going to equip the method with H adaptivity. So I'm not going to change anything about the problem setup. I'm going to train over the exact same time interval, but I'm going to equip the ROM with H adaptivity. Okay, same training, everything is also the same. And this is what we get. So the point here is that uh, the average is obviously I'm tracking the, the shock over time arbitrarily accurately. And the reason I'm able to do that is because if my ROM is detecting it's inaccurate, I'm splitting up the basis vectors such that I capture locally that shock. And I know that eventually I'll get to the right solution. So the question is, how fast am I converging? And I, the answer is, is actually quite fast. So I start off with a basis of dimension 10. And over time, my average basis dimension is only 44. The example where the ROM failed, the previous example, the, the ROM was of dimension 150. So I've actually cut the ROM dimension in a third and improved the accuracy by many or orders of magnitude by equipping it with H refinement. So you can think of this as that my ROM is actually using the correct reduced basis locally, and it's doing so without ever doing any, any, any full order model solves. I'm simply splitting up my existing basis in a goal-oriented, dual to residual way. And this really allows the ROM to capture phenomena that were not present in the training, <clears throat> in the training data. And this is really exciting for a variety of applications because when we apply ROMs to nonlinear dynamical systems in real engineering scenarios like the cavity I showed earlier, you can never be sure that that assumption is going to hold. So this provides the ROM with a fail-safe mechanism that allows us to state that we know that the ROM will always recover the full solution in some limit. Another nice attribute is that H adaptivity enables error control. So let's say that I make my error requirement stricter and stricter then my H adaptivity will deliver a more and more accurate response. It, it has to because it will converge to the full model eventually. Of course, you pay some penalty for that in terms of cost. It gets more expensive as we turn up the, 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 the accuracy requirements. So what we see here is as I, as I again, go from a, a modest tolerance to a tighter tolerance, the average basis dimension increases from 33 to 53. So we're getting a lar higher dimensional ROM on average. The relative error is, of course, going down. Uh, down to less than, less than um, way less than even 0.1% in that case. And the online time is going to go up because our basis is getting more expensive. So, you know, this is basically uh, to be expected, but it's nice because we know that our ROM can always deliver any, order, any accuracy that we require of it. So just to summarize, uh, adaptive H refinement via splitting allows us to incrementally improve the ROM. It doesn't require any large-scale operations. It enables error control, and it, it extends the utility of ROMs to hyperbolic PDEs characterized by advection-dominated phenomena. Um, and so the reference is, is, in the, is in IJNME, and I'd be happy to have any feedback if anyone is interested in learning more about that method or has any comments.